Welcome to Talatera, a podcast about freelance educators working in natural resource fields and environmental education. Who are these educators? What do they do? Join me and let's find out together. This is your host, Tanya Marion. Today, my guest is Alistair Plambeck, retreat leader and founder of Ripple Out Retreats, where he and his team lead transformational travel experiences. Why did Alistair leave California's startup scene to travel the world? Why did he create Ripple Out Retreats? How does he facilitate connections between people and nature? Let's find out. Thank you, Alistair, for stopping by and telling us your story about how you introduce people to backpacking and walking and nature. I'd like to begin my conversations by asking people about their personal relationship with nature. So what is your earliest memory of enjoying nature? Mm. My earliest memory of enjoying nature, the first thing that comes to mind has got to be the ocean. And a particular memory, which I don't think is my earliest, but is one of probably my favorite, is I, I must have been in first or second grade. And I remember my mom pretending to take me to school. It's my birthday. And we lived in San Jose in California, which is about 45 minutes from the beach. And instead of going to school, we ended up, she drove me and a couple of my, my neighborhood friends to the ocean, which is my absolute favorite place to be. Uh, it, it's like going to Disneyland for me. Um, so from a very early age, the ocean always had a very significant and emotionally powerful presence for me, which carried on later actually into my, my early 20s. Most of my 20s actually is uh, I, I continued to surf pretty regularly. So the ocean was always a place for me to recharge. When did you realize nature was important to you? I think that's an ongoing realization that I'm having. I'm 32 now, but I think when I really started to realize how important nature was and what a powerful role it could play in my life was, I'd have to back up probably to around my late 20s. Uh, I I was in business for quite a while. I studied school, I came out of school with a finance major, and I went straight into the startup world, and I was managing businesses pretty early on. And I burned out doing that. And around 27, I left the US and started traveling by myself. And I didn't have much of an agenda. In fact, I had nothing. I had no real plan. And I started, uh, my grandfather is Scottish. I had never been. So I started uh, my travels by going to Scotland. And I decided to hike a pretty famous route there called the West Highland Way, which is a kind of a uh, kind of a backpacking route. It's about a week that goes from, uh, it it goes from, I can't remember, I think it's Loch Lomond all the way up to Ben Nevis. I might have the lake wrong. But, um, and I just fell in love with it. Uh, It was fantastic. I I, I had really sore feet by the end of it, but I, I was addicted. And I started basing all my travels around the next mountains I could go explore. I ended up in Slovakia and Poland hiking, uh, trekking through the high Tatras. And then I kept going east toward uh, Romania and I spent some time in the Carpathians and then the Caucasus. And then eventually, as any mountain junkie ends up, uh, I was in the Himalayas a few times. And uh, I just found it extremely replenishing. But also, I was learning so much about myself in those settings. And so it was creating a, a very special space to kind of reflect on my life and 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 kind of explore myself. Wow, that is just amazing. And it's a huge shift from the ocean recharging you. So now the mountains and the countryside. Much more masculine energy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about nature? Have you been able to uh, identify and articulate for yourself what it is that you respond to? I think it's... Um, so I'm an introvert as well, which I think and, and introverts seem to to have a high appreciation of nature. And I think part of it is because nature is so unassuming. Uh, it's always been a space where my own thoughts can kind of be projected onto the landscape. It's a safe space. 
I'm able to kind of embrace my solitude there and be alone and be absolutely quiet and just kind of let my, my mind run. And when I first discovered the mountains, I had been living in San Diego, which is very high density as far as people, uh, even at the ocean. And uh, I realized when I started walking through mountains that it was really the first time in my life I, that I had been alone. And, that, and I realized along with that as I was going how starved I had been for solitude and uh, how much I had been suffering because I didn't, I didn't have a space like that before. So I think the wilderness kind of, you know, John Muir, I think would describe it kind of as a, a his cathedral. I, I think it definitely has that aspect for me. It's it's definitely been the the space where I'm able I'm able to to kind of explore myself and uh, and and also to explore the world. Your experiences with nature then must have influenced what you do for Ripple Out retreats. Yeah, so I, I was still on a a trekking kick when the idea for Ripple Out retreats came. Uh, my wife and I were trekking through the Yosemite High Sierras, uh, which funnily enough, although they're kind of in my backyard, I grew up in San Jose, I had not spent a lot of time in. Um, and so this was her first time to California. And part of it was I wanted to show her the national parks. So we did about an eight day uh, backpacking trip through the High Sierras, which was absolutely stunning. It was amazing. Of all the places I've been in the world, as far as the mountains, Yosemite's High Sierras, to me, are up there with the Himalayas uh, as some of the most amazing places to walk. And uh, we were coming off that trip pretty inspired. And I know I I had a couple friends that were starting to do retreats. And the idea was basically that I wanted to introduce people to mountains the way I'd been introduced to them. Uh, Most of my life, I didn't really realize they were there or, or... I'd never been really brought into them. And my experience with backpacking particularly was it was something that was better learned through a teacher than on your own, uh, which is the way I had learned it. I had just started going in the mountains and then figuring out, which is kind of dangerous at times. So I wanted to bring that experience to more people. What is most important to me about that is I wanted to bring the kind of self-exploration and and self-learning that can come with walking in nature for extended periods of time. I, I attribute a lot of a lot of the changes that came from from traveling and leaving the US, uh, and I'm still kind of on that adventure uh, about four years later, but a lot of the big insights, a lot of the big changes happened because I, was, I spent long periods of time in nature, and that was really powerful for me. And I wanted to start using that as kind of a, a tool for encouraging and leading people through their own personal exploration. So the mountains were a backdrop for that. How do you introduce people to backpacking? And the people who participate in the programs of your retreat, are they new to backpacking? They have, do they have some experience? So the first trip we've done, it was this summer in Yosemite. We brought, uh, we had a group, I led a group of 13 people. Uh, including the our, our guides, and they had not had any backpacking experience. I think one person might have backpacked once in their life, so they're completely new to it. And we prepare them. There's a vetting process to bring everyone on the trip, which includes you know checking their medical background and and also just how they're doing with their physical and mental health. But uh, then we just take them up there and we start slow. The first day we walk just about five or six miles, you know, let everyone get accustomed to wearing a heavy pack. And uh, then we start ramping it up a little bit. And the idea is for it to be emotionally and mentally challenging. We do some mindfulness work. We do a lot of facilitated conversations as we take people through the wild. So it's meant to be kind of not only a backpacking trip, but a way for them to explore themselves within a safe space, within, within, a, within a small group. How did your first trip go? It went excellent. I was extremely nervous, <laughs> <laughs> uh, having not done anything like that. I think my, my metric for success on this one was that no one died. That was the real, 
the the real thing. That was what I was worried about. <laughs> and no one did. And everyone actually had a great time. You know, one thing that I found very interesting about it was, so we had people, it's a 10 day retreat and five of those days are spent out in the wild. So that's five days without contact with the outer world where that's five days with no phones. That's five days carrying everything you need and nothing else. Um, it's five days of, of walking and five days of being surrounded in the wilderness. And that was the longest period that any of the, any of these people had ever spent in the wilderness. And that is kind of what lights me up about doing this is because I know how powerful that can be. And we've seen post trip, uh, that it's forged pretty interesting bonds. Uh, And I wouldn't say like the whole group comes together as a community, but there's been small kind of subgroups that have stayed in touch. There's been a one-on-one uh, relationships. There's, I've, I've been involved in several, but there's been a lot of like crisscrossing and, and uh, mismatching since. And it's been really interesting to see the relationships that have been forged out of such an intense experience. How did people's relationship with nature change during those five days? Did they talk about what they were seeing or what they were noticing because of the experience you provide? Did it trigger conversations about uh, childhood experiences in nature or previous experiences they may have had in nature? There was a couple interesting things I noticed that were kind of unexpected for me. One of them was on the second day of walking, we introduced noble silence. I spent a fair amount of time on retreat, uh, in, in especially meditation retreats. And noble silence is something that's been pretty powerful for me. And it's something that kind of happens automatically when we go out into the mountains on our own. Uh, but the idea of noble silence is basically that we, we stay quiet. We don't communicate through gestures, eye contact, or, or language of any type uh, with anyone else. And so we introduced this practice for a, a few hours a day of noble silence, and we would walk in noble silence. A little apprehensive about it at first. We had a very chatty and talkative group. And, uh, you know, they come from all kinds of backgrounds. So I wasn't sure how that was going to be received. And we did it. And uh, the response was overwhelming. People loved it. Uh, People were starting to, because once we stopped talking, people's focus and attention could either go inward or also outward. And so they were starting to notice all the sounds, different plants and animals, and really starting to pay attention to what was around them in a way that we rarely ever do in, in life, uh, and, and definitely not for, for very long periods. They had nothing to interrupt them or distract them, and, and the art of walking is very meditative in itself, and it kind of gets you often into a flow state. So that was really interesting, because when we stopped and, and we broke the noble silence, Everyone was asking us to do it more, and we ended up doing it a lot more than we had planned on throughout the the trip uh, because everyone wanted to continue doing it, which was a bit of a surprise to me uh, when we started. So that was a really interesting experience. One other that I think also kind of surprised me was the the peak of the trip was literally a peak. So on the third day of the trek, we uh, climbed Cloud's Rest, which is about 10,000 feet. It's about 1,000 feet. It overlooks Half Dome and gives you this beautiful view in toward the valley. And you have a 360-degree panoramic view of the entire park. It's absolutely gorgeous. And it's a pretty challenging hike up for anyone who's not accustomed to it. Uh, we start 7 or 8 in the morning, and we get there for sunset. And you're walking all day. You're climbing probably around two or 3,000 feet and, you know, 10 or 12 miles. So it's definitely challenging uh, for for your third day if you you haven't done a lot of backpacking. And the day, the whole day is a kind of physical endurance test. But the interesting, the really interesting part came at the end, uh, which was, there's a section, probably the last 15, 20 minutes up to the peak uh, after we'd done all our climbing, we'd put our heavy packs down and set up camp. And then there's this final section. And it looks like you're taking 
steps into nothing. Like you're just walking up this like really narrow kind of stone steps into the sky and you can't see very far ahead. It's a, it's a strange kind of optical illusion. And on both, on all sides of you, at points it gets as narrow as about like three feet. It's, it's you know, not super narrow and uh, you do have a little bit of leeway on the sides, but then it's just a ridge and on both sides it drops away for, you know, thousands of feet. And so uh, it's very exposed. And I uh, was surprised, there's a few people that had no problem with that. <laughs> but uh, a lot of people uh, had, had a lot of things come up and I ended up having a uh, walking about four or five people one at a time to the top through this very exposed section. And what was interesting about it was most, you know, there was a fear of heights, but something else came up at some point on that ridge, often at the very most exposed part, the part you want to keep walking on a lot of, personal stuff would come up in, from their life. And I found it really fascinating to see how being exposed on a peak had forced them to also explore the ways in their life that they felt vulnerable or exposed or, or scared. And it was very interesting to walk each person through their own personal fears uh, to the top of the top of the peak. Sounds like a very powerful experience. I've seen pictures, some of the pictures on your website, and and I've wondered about that peak. I, I wondered how much space is on either side. <laughs> Not very yeah, much at times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's amazing. On the trip back, people get a second chance to walk through where they've just been. How was the trip back? So the trip down from that particular point, uh, they do get to walk for probably about 30 minutes on the same trail. Otherwise, we we uh, do kind of a line all the way into Yosemite Valley. So we don't do much time on the same trail. On that part, I think people were pretty apprehensive to walk that section again, uh, especially because the sun was setting. And it required a lot of leadership between me and the team um, but it was definitely much easier having gotten everyone up because there were a couple people that didn't think they were going to come up and finally chose to. And we had a moment at the top, which was spectacular where everyone was kind of arm in arm in a circle and, you know, people were crying. It was a very emotional moment. Um, and we were, we were up there at the top as a team, uh, all of us as the sun was setting. And after that, the, the group was extremely extremely tight um there was a shift in the energy that didn't go away after that for, for the rest of the trip and that was really interesting to see once people got down from the very kind of harrowing part <laughs> they were definitely i think a, a a combination of exhausted and just ecstatic um that that's how i'd probably describe it <laughs> Yeah. And then how long did it take to get to Yosemite Valley from there? Still a couple days, still a couple days. So we kept walking for a few more days uh, and we used that as an opportunity to kind of explore some of the things that came up. Everyone had their challenge that day or several challenges and it was pretty good material for facilitating conversations around that. And I think everyone on that trip, in the coming days felt they had accomplished something, something big. And it didn't have anything to do, I mean, really with the peak. I think, you know, when you climb something like that and you've never done anything like that, you have to kind of work through your own shadow, your own fears, concerns, uh, issues, whatever it is that, whatever that voice is in your head. And, uh, and what I noticed with everyone in the days we had left with them after that was a big shift in how they saw themselves and, you know, how they were returning to uh, the quote unquote regular world or society, I should say. To plan a trip like this must take an enormous amount of planning because you got to pack everything in and then you need to pack all of your trash out. How did participants um, how did you first plan to bring everything in and what did they think about packing everything out? 
<laughs> I think everyone's major concern is, and everyone kind of gets squeamish when they hear it is that they have to, you have to pack out your own waste. You know, everyone's like a little like, what? Yeah. Uh, so, so at least your, your own toilet paper in this case, you can, you can bury your waste, but the, the, the toilet paper needs to come out with you. Um, so <laughs> there's always a getting over that. I think people get over that pretty quickly, but yeah, the planning was tremendous having never done anything like this. I mean, well, having only ever had to care for myself really, or another person in, in my, uh, backpacking experiences, uh, taking a group was, uh, in a lot of ways, a pretty heavy burden, you know, and it took a lot of preparation. Obviously there's first aid classes to take and insurance to get and uh, a fair amount of hoops to jump through as far as Yosemite because Yosemite is a very well-managed park um, but they do have some some pretty strict requirements about what you need to do if you're going if you're going to be an outfitter in their park um, so there was a lot of work on that side that took over a year to get done but the the immediate planning of food <laughs> Julie Roxanne is a is a chef and so that I don't think we would have been able to do it without her because the the food planning was also, we actually uh, made it a little bit more complicated on ourselves because we wanted to also introduce people to a plant-based diet for 10 days. And that was kind of, this is all going back to the idea of it being a retreat. We didn't want it to just be a tour or an adventure. Uh, we, we really wanted to take people completely out of their lives for that period so that, um, because my experience has been on, on retreats, especially retreats that have around 10 days or more, is that that's really when things can come up and you can have pretty earth-shattering realizations about, about the way you're living or just notice patterns uh, and, and things like that. So that time frame is pretty powerful, I think. So we really wanted to use that to our advantage in a couple ways. So one of them was to put people in the wilderness as long as possible. But another one was that we wanted to introduce people to a plant-based diet for 10 days, uh, not because we wanted or not because we expected everyone to, to continue on that, but because we thought it'd be interesting as an experiment for people to see what that felt like. And, um, and, and maybe there'd be some connections that would be made either in moving to a plant-based diet or moving off a plant-based diet. Uh, and there were uh, for some people. so. That made things even harder because that mean we were gluten free and and basically vegan. The, so the planning for that was extremely difficult. It was a a lot of trips to Costco and <laughs> and the local like uh, the local grocery store and a lot of packaging and a lot of weighing. Uh, I think we spent several nights doing that, but it, it did feel like it, it felt very much like I think I got the sense like oh this is this is what a military expedition in, in miniature must feel like. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, An amazing amount of work. I've heard you explain it in a, in a past episode on your own podcast. And it was just amazing. In the days leading into your uh, retreat, you must go over the leave no trace principles. Yes. 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 Yeah. And so um, this is the first time that they've probably – most people, I would assume, have really encountered the leave no trace principle. So, as you mentioned earlier, they're bringing out their toilet paper it was um, a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> it's more than just pick up your trash. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and we try to take it a step further, which is pick up anyone else's trash too. I I think uh, leave it better than you found it. Uh, which which so that's something we kind of add to the leave no trace. Um, yeah, I, I think that's an interesting experience to definitely have when you're out in the wilderness and and you just realize everything you do leaves an impact. And um, it definitely re helps you realize how fragile these beautiful environments are. And, you know, you, you, we're a group, we were a group of 13, so we had to be careful. You know, for example, in that, in that case, you need to make sure you're bringing water to the camp just so that people aren't walking to the stream and, and starting to forge paths that, that remain after you're there and, and, and things like this. So I, it, that definitely, I think, was new for, for most people. And, uh, and, and I hope, yeah, I know for me, the Leave No Trace principles has started in the wilderness, but it's something that I've carried back 
into my life and, and I try to live from more and more uh, every day. What did you learn about your community this past summer and your retreats? Is there anything that you'll do differently next time or improve upon? Oh. Yeah, there's definitely things we'll improve upon. I'd like to find more ways to, you know, in on this trip, we use the hero's journey as a framework, uh, which is comes from Joseph Campbell's work. Uh, so we use that kind of as a model for what we're doing. One of the things, Ripple Out Retreats, uh, we're leading a couple trips next year. One is to France and Spain to walk part of the Camino. So that's not in the wilderness. It's more of a cultural walk. Uh, we're, we're leading another one to Bali, which isn't going to be uh, a walk at all. So, And then we're going to be doing this, this Yosemite one again. And I'm definitely most passionate about the, the wilderness retreats because I think the uh, spending time in the wilderness has such a power. Uh, so I would like to bring more of uh, exercises and elements that we can kind of weave into the experience as we did the hero's journey to help people uh, kind of reflect on their lives and explore. I think that's something I'd also like to develop the community you know, we did a vetting process and we had pretty, th- pretty good relationships with everyone before we brought them. And, uh, and those relationships have continued after, but I'd like to be more intentional about developing the group and, and before and trying to help it continue after. I think those are aspects that we could definitely be uh, better at. Uh, this first one, we were very focused on the actual track. And later on, I would like to focus more and more on the group dynamics and how that particular journey can be a kind of a creative canvas for personal work and interpersonal work. And that, that's, I think, one of the things that I've really learned. Uh, I had a pretty strong suspicion from my own experience, but that I, I really saw with this trip was the power of a journey. You know, we kind of think about it as this is a small 10-day journey. And but this, this is reflective of a much larger journey, the journey of our lives. And my experience walking in nature and going on these treks, whether it be for a few days or for a month, is that they have so much to offer as far as insights and symbolism for the larger journey that we're all on. And that's what uh, these trips allow us to do is, is they, they, we do these kind of small, almost like miniature lives, these, these small journeys. and we can use those to uh, reflect on the bigger journey and you know, perhaps correct course or, or make, make a change, uh, which is why we called the company Ripple Out Retreats. It's this underlying belief that you know, an inner change can, can ripple out and, and have, a, have a big difference outside of us, even the smallest changes. And I, I think of the image of a ripple in a pond and uh, how you know, you, if you throw a rock in the middle of a pond, the ripple that comes out ends up touching all shores. That's also the way I think about the, the retreats is uh, any change, any change we can make uh, has the potential to be very, very, very far reaching. Absolutely. That's, that's beautiful. I was wondering about the name. That was one of my questions. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you for offering that in the. <laughs> you're, you're very welcome. <laughs> Your two trips next year. What type of cultural and heritage experiences, what type of interpretation will you be doing on those trips? Yeah, so um, in addition to our wilderness trip in Yosemite, we're in the state, we're we're definitely going on one in Spain and France in September. Uh, We're going to be walking the Camino uh, and we're going to be walking a very interesting part of the Camino, which is saint jean pied de Port to Pamplona. So it starts in the foothills of France at the very end of, of the Camino in France. And if, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, the Camino de Santiago is a spiritual pilgrimage in Europe. So you, you, you start in anywhere really in Europe, you could start walking and everyone ends up going over the Pyrenees Mountains and then walking through uh, northern Spain to Santiago. It's a very famous pilgrimage that's been going on for uh, definitely centuries and our adventure probably uh, a millennium and it's so it has some interesting aspects we're still going through the mountains but it's much more cultural so 
the theme we're going to explore around that one is stories, uh, our stories, how, how we how we think about stories, the stories we tell ourselves. And I think this, that's going to be really rich because it's such a cultural melting pot, the Camino. There's so many different types of people on it, doing it for so many different types of reasons. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating. It's a really great snapshot of Western Europe. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun as a way to, to investigate the stories uh, that we have, the stories we tell ourselves, and also the stories we want to live out in our lives. So that's that one. And uh, we're also leading another trip to Bali, probably in the spring. That one's a little bit less certain. I think we're going to spend most of the time uh, in one place. And we will probably use it to to explore. I, I'm very passionate about uh, the MBTI, which is the Myers Briggs type indicator, and also the underlying ideas that come with that. That are uh, um, the theoretical origin origins come from Carl Jung, who was a psychologist in in the uh, early 20th century, uh, mid 20th century. And uh, so I think I suspect we will explore probably some of uh, some of the uh, some personality type and also archetypes and and link that back to um, to uh, the personal journey. I know you've been wanting to create a space for participants to continue their conversation. Your next two trips are uh, very much about conversation. I mean, the yes. spirit trip was too, but I've, the emphasis appears to be more so for the next two trips. And so, how will you continue that? after a trip? That's a really good question. I, I think we definitely uh, were looking for opportunities to connect the retreat participants over different retreats. You know, I, I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, I'm hoping it'll start to emerge. Uh, I think it's going to depend on the people that show up to these trips as well. But I think for me, it would probably be some form of ongoing uh, conversation so maybe maybe it's just a uh, an online call perhaps that would be the way to start something small like that but i i definitely would like to continue it the, these trips are like an intense point of an ongoing journey and an ongoing conversation and uh i think as we get the trip part of it nailed down uh our attention is naturally going to turn to okay how do we interconnect these groups how do we they're very interesting people that decide to do something like this. And so how do we connect them with each other and, and how do we help them like facilitate an ongoing relationship? Because often these people are not just coming to see a place, they're coming to find other people that uh, are interested in these things and these ideas and having these kind of conversations and having these kind of journeys or adventures. I think some of this uh, spawns from loneliness or a sense of alienation in their current uh, society or or where they live and that's and so it's kind of a magnet for curious people as well and that's something we definitely want to encourage and, and facilitate in the future mm -hmm. yeah you're you're providing a community for people to be seen and to be heard and that's yes. very yeah and that's very powerful and also learn about places and other people and cultures and heritage yeah, it's really exciting work. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. it's it's uh it's hard, and we're still kind of chiseling out exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it. But it's really rewarding. Uh, just the the response and the experience being on on a, a, a you know ten days is a long time to spend with strangers, a, a group of strangers, and uh, a lot can happen in those ten days. And it's been really really exciting to be a part of that and to have the opportunity to, to lead something like that has, has been phenomenal. I, I, I'm not sure I ever really imagined that, that I'd get the chance to do that. And so I think we also just want to try to keep a good thing going. What's next for you after these next two trips? What is beyond 2020? That's a pretty timely question. Um, <laughs> so it's something I'm thinking a lot about right now. I think as far as my work goes, uh, what's next? The Ripple Out Retreats is part of something that's starting to come into more focus, which is uh, I, I also work with people one-on-one. -on -one. And so I think men's work, particularly what it means to be a man in 
in society today, a healthy, whole uh, man. Also, I have a soft side for introverts, uh, having been one or being one, and uh, that journey. Uh, I think a lot of times the introverted voice and the introverted personality can be um, overwhelmed and drowned out in at least in American culture, uh, which is which can be very extroverted among other things. And so I see a lot of my work being around uh, helping men become men and uh, helping introverts to recognize they are different and to accept those those powers and uh, and realize that they are phenomenal strengths that that come with that that I sorely think our, our society needs. So I see a lot of my work being around those two areas and coupling that particularly with wilderness experiences uh, interests me a lot. Thank you, Alistair, for your time and for sharing your story. And I wish you much success because what you've put together and I know the backstory for, for at least this Sierra's trip. <laughs> and uh, you did an amazing job. Thanks, Tanya. It's, uh, it's an honor to uh, be talking to you about it. I really enjoyed it. To learn more about Alistair and the trips to Yosemite, France, Spain, and Indonesia, visit the show notes to view all relevant links. Talaterra is a podcast for and about independent educators working in natural resource fields and environmental education. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with friends and colleagues. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Tanya Marion. <laughs>